Last week we finished chapter one with these words. So Naomi came, uh, came back from the land of Moab with the daughter-in-law of Ruth, the Moabitess. They arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, if you have watched the first installment of this study, then you will know exactly what time they arrived. I try to exp explain the connection between the beginning of the barley harvest and the Jewish calendar. I mean, any Jew at that time who read that statement, they arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest, would know exactly when they arrived in Bethlehem. They arrived short during or shortly after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. If they were arriving in this year, in the year 2020, they would be arriving somewhere around April the 16th, as that is the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread this year. And traditionally, when the barley harvest would begin in earnest. Now I explained in the first lesson for this series, uh, I explained all that. And so if you want a little more confusing explanation, you can go back and watch that. But this evening, I'm gonna give you a little more simplified version. Now the Jewish day ends and begins at sundown. Passover lamb was sacrificed at sundown on the 14th of the month of Nisan. And so when the sun went down, the 15th of Nisan began and began the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which lasted for seven days. And so because the Passover lamb was sacrificed at sundown on the 14th, that day was known as Preparation Day. So I've got a little thing up here. I don't know if you can read it on your screens, but anyway, this I put the, the 14th of, of Nissan here. And so then that sunset was the Passover right here. And so the Jewish day ends at sunset, begins at sunset, uh, and so that would be the, the Passover. And then this day right here, 15th of Nisan, began the eight day, or the, the seven day, excuse me, Feast of Unleavened Bread. But because, you know, the Passover was here, and this day was known as Preparation Day, then it all became kind of one big thing. Uh, that eight day observance and very often this whole thing is called Passover, even though technically the Passover is right here, then this is the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But something else uh, very significant happened during the seven day period of Unleavened Bread. The barley harvest officially began. God gave specific, specific instructions as to when it was to begin and what was to take place as it began. Uh, one of those places that we find those instructions is Leviticus chapter 23. Verse 11, we find these words, he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So the priest, uh, whoever is, um, Beginning their barley harvest, they, they bring in the the sheaf to the priest. The priest waves it. Like I said, if you want a more detailed explanation, you can go back to the first lesson. But the bar, barley harvest officially began during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, it was to begin on the day after the first Sabbath during the week. During, during that, that week, that, this uh, time period here. But after the, the first Sabbath, during this feast, everyone with a field of barley would go into their field and harvest for the first time that year 
and they would bring what they harvested to the priest. The priest would wave it as an offering. Until that happened, the barley harvest could not begin. So what eventually became the practice after the temple was built was that the high priest would bring an over of barley into the temple on that day to present it before the Lord. And you might want to know how much an over is. Well, best guess is that it's a little bit less than a gallon. But the beginning of the barley harvest was not the only significant thing that happened on that day. The other significance of that day was that it began Shavuot, okay, the Feast of Weeks. So we guess 23, verse 15 says, You shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from that day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. <laughs> Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. So this began became known as counting the Elmer. And after the temple was built, the Feast of Weeks culminated at the end of the countdown with another celebration in Jerusalem. And in the New Testament, we encounter this celebration in the book of Acts, where it is called by its Greek name. It's called Pentecost, meaning 50 for the 50 days that were counted down to the celebration. So if we look at Leviticus chapter 23, verse 11, you notice that this all starts after the Sabbath, the first Sabbath, during this week of unleavened bread. And two traditions came out of us, out of this. The first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was always a Sabbath, regardless of what day of the week it fell on. Okay, if, if Leviticus 23 intended this Sabbath right here, then the countdown would always begin on the 16th. And this was the view of the Pharisees. The other possible understanding of Leviticus chapter 23 is that the intended day was after the first naturally occurring Sabbath. And actually, that makes more sense because they were to count down seven Sabbaths. So if you begin with this Sabbath, you don't necessarily get 50 if you go. Anyway, um, this uh, that was the other understanding was that the first naturally occurring Sabbath during that week. Um, in other words, the countdown to uh, the Feast of Weeks would begin on a Sunday, on the first Sunday of this, of this time period. And this was the view of the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were the ones who were in charge of the temple at this time. Uh, the, the Sadducees were also the traditionalists. And so their position was probably what was in practice at the time of Ruth. Uh, and also in practice at the time of Jesus. It was probably not until after this, this, the destruction of the temple that the view of the Pharisees came into prominence. And it's the view of the Pharisees which was followed in modern day Judaism. So if you look up, say on the internet, uh, you will find, uh, you know, counting of the Omer, you will find that it begins on the 16th of, of Nisan because they consider this to be the first Sabbath, regardless of what day it actually is. But this is the, the reason that's what kind of prompted me to pick Ruth as a study during this time because we're coming up quickly on uh, what most Christians call Easter. 
Um, it's the it doesn't necessarily fall on the Jewish uh, Passover, though it actually should because that's when Jesus was crucified. But anyway, this was this is what uh, prompted me to choose this as a study. Today we we celebrated Palm Sunday as leading up to the Resurrection Sunday. But we know that Jesus was crucified on Preparation Day. This day right here, the 14th of Nisan. Mark chapter 15, verse 42 tells us when it was already evening because it was Preparation Day. That is the day before the Sabbath. This day is always a Sabbath. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, who himself was looking forward to the kingdom of God, came boldly and went into Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Luke chapter 23, verse 50, says, There was a good and righteous man named Joseph, a member of the Sanhedrin, who had not agreed with their plan of action, in other words, the plan to crucify Jesus. He was from Arimathea, a Judean town, and was looking forward to the kingdom of God. He approached Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Taking it down, he wrapped it in fine linen and placed it in a tomb cut into the rock. There was no one who had ever been placed where no one had ever been placed. It was preparation day. The Sabbath was about to begin. So it was the price of the Passover lamb at sunset. Um, and it's just like our months. The, the dates do not correlate to a day of the week. I mean, last year, my birthday was on a Saturday, and this year, my birthday was on a Monday. So when Mark and Luke tell us that Jesus was crucified on Preparation Day, it could have been any day of the week, because the next day was always a Sabbath. But when they tell us that the, the Sabbath was about to begin, okay, that's just... What followed Preparation Day was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And um, this Sabbath day could be any day of the week, just like this could be any day of the week. So regardless of the day of the week, so we, you know, you don't know what day of the week it was, even though it's called the Sabbath. However, all the Gospels are clear about which day of the week Jesus was resurrected. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 1 says, After the, the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. That's Matthew 28, verse 1. Mark chapter 16, verse 2 says, Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. Luke chapter 24, verse 1 says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. And John chapter 20, verse 1 says, on the, first, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So there's there's no doubt about it. All four uh, Gospels testify to the fact that Jesus was, was resurrected before dawn on the first day of the week. Um, so, and so the, as, as I point out many times, that the uh, day began at sunset the day before we consider the day before. So we know that for sure Resurrection Day was a Sunday because the, the night before what we consider the day would actually be the night of that day. It's kind of 
confusing to me to think about, but um, anyway. So if if we want to know what day of the week uh, Jesus was crucified, then all we have to do is count count backwards from Sunday. Um, and how do we know how many days to count? Well, Jesus told us. And chapter 12, verse 38, says that then some of the scribes and the Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation demand a sign, that no sign will be given them, except, given to it, except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish, Three days and three nights. So the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Okay, so we know that Jesus was buried before sundown right here on the 14th. And he was in the grave the night of the Sabbath, or the yeah, the day that followed, which was a the first day of the of uh, the feast of unleavened bread, and that day, so until right here, the sunset. So that's one day, one night, and then one day, and then one night. So if you say I. Get confused on where, where to put my little arrows, but so day, night, that's one, then day and night, that's two, and then day and, and then night. That's three. And Jesus' resurrection was on this night, which was uh, Sunday. So if we count back from Sunday, then we get come out, you know, we get, so he was in the grave Sunday night. Yeah, he was in the grave Sunday night. He was in the grave uh, Sunday day. Well, I'll do it with our, our day. So, so I get I get too confused thinking about trying to think about it in a in a Jewish uh, with their with their time schedule. Anyway, so it'll be Sunday night, Sunday day, Saturday night, sun, Saturday day, Friday night, Friday day, and then. So since so, okay, yeah, now I'm I'll be, it was Sunday night for them, but anyway, it'd be, it'd be our and I messed it all up. Anyway, it'd be Saturday night for us, and because because they for us they were coming to the grave early on Sunday morning. So it'd be Saturday night, Saturday day that's one, Friday night, Friday day that's two. Thursday night, and then he was buried on Thursday day, and so that's three. So probably was crucified on a on a Thursday, and that would make this Friday, Friday, Saturday, and then we have Resurrection Sunday, right? Um, there was a Sabbath that happened to fall on a Friday, and the next day was also a Sabbath, like the Sabbath of the week. Anyway, so it stands to reason that preparation day that year was on a Thursday. It also confirms that the tradition of the Sadducees was being followed. Thursday at sunset was the Passover. And and then we we can count the 
the three three days and three nights that Jesus was in the ground. Jesus' crucifixion was on the day of Passover. Um, but his resurrection signaled the beginning of the harvest. Remember the, the Sunday, uh, the day after the Sabbath? That would be the beginning of the harvest. And the countdown of the 50 days to the Feast of First Fruits, or the, as Leviticus says in, in chapter, and, and the coming of the Holy Spirit, the, the harvest of the church, the start of the church, as Leviticus says, Chapter 23, on that day, you will offer a new grain offering after the 50 days. So this was the time of year that Naomi and Ruth arrived in Bethlehem. Naomi had a relative, and we we're reading now from chapter 2 of Ruth. So now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side named Boaz. He was a prominent man of noble character. From the Elimelech's family. Now, last week I we talked about inheritance. I pointed out that limited Elimelech had an inheritance of land which he probably sold until the year of Jubilee, uh, when he had moved to Moab. He sold it until that point. Uh, I also pointed out that only an heir in the line of Elimelech could inherit. The land or buy it back or receive it back in the year of Jubilee. Since Elimelech had no heir, the inheritance would first go to his brother. And if he had no brother, then it was to go to his father's brother. And if none of them were alive, then it was to go to his nearest male relative. So, in other words, Naomi and Ruth had no claim to the inheritance. I also talked about the fact that if a man died without producing an heir, then it was the duty of the man's brother to marry the man's widow and produce an heir by his widow on behalf of his brother. So if the man was had no brother, then it would stand to reason that the, the uh, same law of inheritance would, would apply. And their relative, a near relative of the deceased man, could also marry the widow and produce an heir. So probably picked up on that, that Boaz uh, is beginning to fit that description of someone who could fill that role. He was a prominent man from the Limelech's family. Ruth 2 verse 2 says, the Moabite, Moabitess asked Naomi, Ruth the, the Moabitess, that's no, I mean, will you let me go into the fields and gather fallen grain from behind someone who allows me to? Naomi answered her, go ahead, my daughter. So Ruth left and entered the field to gather grain behind the harvesters. She happened to be in the portion of the land belonging to Boaz, who was from Elimelech's family. Later, when Boaz arrived from Bethlehem, he said to the harvesters, the Lord be with you. The Lord bless you. They replied. Boaz asked his servants, who the servant who was in charge of the harvesters, whose young woman is this? Will you let me gather fallen grain from among the bundles behind the har harvesters? She came and has remained from early morning until now except that she rested a little in the shelter. Then Boaz said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, don't go and gather grain in another field. And don't leave this one, but stay here close to my young women. See which field they are harvesting and follow them. Haven't I ordered the young men not to touch you? When you are thirsty, go and drink from the jars the young men have filled. So Boaz, as was pointed out earlier, was a righteous man. Uh, that's verse uh, one in this chapter of the, the same mighty man of wealth. Um, there's two different uh, 
Hebrew words there, and they can be tra both be translated in those ways. Gabor, which means usually means strong or mighty, while if I don't say this wrong, but it's, it's a hard H, it's a high L, is often translated as a man of valor or wealth, or a man of wealth. Um, but what we see as we read through this, this passage is, is that the emphasis is on his character rather than his wealth. His greeting to his harvesters was not a pious pretense. Ruth gathered in his fields what the harvesters had, le apparent, had uh, left behind. And apparently she wasn't the only person doing that. The leaving of grain behind for the poor was intentional. And it was in keeping with the law of Moses. Leviticus chapter 23, 22 says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you are not to reap all the way to the edge of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the foreign residents. I am the Lord your God. Of course, Ruth certainly fit the description. She was both poor and a foreign resident. So picking back up with verse 10. She bowed with her face to the ground and said to him, Why are you so kind to notice me, although I am a foreigner? Boaz answered her, Everything you have done for your mother-in-law since your husband's death has been fully reported to me. You left your, your father and mother in the land of your birth, and now you have come to a people you didn't previously know. May the Lord reward you for what you've done, and may you receive a full reward from the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. My Lord, she said, you have been so kind to me, for you have comforted and encouraged your slave." Although I am not like one of your female servants. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the book of Ruth and the many lessons that it has for us. Um, Lord, I pray as we look into these things that you would speak to us and, and make them applicable to our lives. Lord, that, um, this speaks about a, a time of the year that we're celebrating right now and also has so many other things to teach us. Uh, pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.